one, one day we can do that with technology, <laughs> without Lewis. <laughs> Make all your phones clap in sequence, that'd be amazing. Hello! Oh, isn't, it, isn't the weather beautiful now it's stopped raining and the roof is not caving in with loads of water? Um, which is good, because otherwise I was going to do this in the rain, which wouldn't have helped. Um, my name's Ruth. Uh, you can find me if you need to all over the internet, so at Rumira. Um, that's uh, on Twitter, CodePen, GitHub, wherever you want to. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about MIDI, which has absolutely nothing to do with JavaScript. Fun times. Um, but the reason that I want to do that is to address a common misconception about MIDI. And if we do have sound, because I'm prompting the sound guy, this is going to happen, um, that's because of this. See, it needs to be louder. Right? Yeah. That's a real website. Yep. Cameronsworld.net. It's actually new as well. Yep. It's a whole bunch of GeoCity stuff all put together. Um, uh, yeah, it's really amazing. Um, but what you heard then, that's not MIDI. That's digital audio. Um, the sound file was probably created in a piece of software which supports MIDI, but that itself is not MIDI. Those bleepy sounds, that's just audio. Um, and there is a reason that people like, conceive that to be MIDI, um, and that's because MIDI itself stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And so people sort of get hung up on this sort of musical instrument bit and think that MIDI itself is making those sounds. But actually, really, it is just a digital interface. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. I want to change your views about MIDI and show you that it can be something quite awesome. So MIDI sort of came around because there was a rise of digital and crazy instruments in the 70s. Uh, they were sort of begun being made in the 50s, but they gained in real popularity in the 70s. Um, and what they found was there was no way for these instruments to talk to each other. So there were some industry experts, some musicians, some music manufacturers, all got together, and they thought, wouldn't it be good if we wrote a specification so all these instruments could talk to each other? Just a digital protocol, basically. Nothing more, nothing less. So in 1983, General MIDI 1 came out. That was the first specification. There are more specifications now, and I will talk about them in a minute. Um, but the original one, General MIDI 1, came out in 1983. It was comprised of three different parts. There was the actual technical bit, which was the, how the data was getting sort of passed between all these instruments. There was a file format. Today, you'll probably find MIDI's data is sort of in other file formats because it's sort of moved on. And I'm not going to talk about file formats today, by the way. You can find out more. You can probably Google it. Um, and there was a connector specification, which back then was a DIN connector specification. Some of you might have seen it. It's a big sort of fat connector. It's got five pins. Um, and that's how MIDI data was transported from one piece of equipment to the next piece of equipment and so on and so forth. Uh, nowadays, we do actually have USB, which is actually preferred because you can go back and forth along the same line rather than going in and out. I'm sure you've seen the MIDI in and out stuff. And that was general MIDI 1. Today. There's a lot of specification. General MIDI 1 has been moved on to General MIDI 2. Um, it's a little bit like HTML4 to HTML5. Everything got a bit bigger, a bit shinier, so there's more stuff. And there's loads of other specifications. If you go to MIDI.org, they list all of them, and you can read all about them. I'm not going to go into every single one. I'm just going to go through some of them today. The core of General MIDI digital specification is messages. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview. This is sort of digital messages going over the wire, basically. Um, there's channel messages and there's system messages. Uh, channel messages are localized to the sort of instrument that you have. So if you think about a digital keyboard, a musical digital keyboard, not, not the one on your laptop, um, when you're pressing a key, the data messages being sent, they're channel messages, which is, I'm playing this note and I'm pressing it this hard. System messages are things like, hi, I'm a keyboard, and I'm going to send my keyboard information to this other system over here. The best way for me to show this to you is for me to actually show you. So you're going to have to get involved in this presentation, by the way. I'm not going to just stand here and talk slides with you. You're going to need a device. Something like a phone will do. Um, some of you have got your laptops out already. If you go to that URL, I can, just, I can actually show you MIDI data. Remember, some people are getting their phones out. It's ctdo.io forward slash js. Fingers crossed this is working. Can I get a nod from someone when they've got something? I'm, I'm getting hands raised. I'm going to say that's cool. Yeah. OK, so you should. <laughs> and it's like, yes, it's working. Ooh, it's working. So you should be displayed with something a little bit like this. 
Uh, this is an emulated musical digital keyboard for you all. And if you press the buttons on those keys, you should see two bits of data above the keyboard. So this is exactly what you'd see if you plug in a musical keyboard into your computer and run this code in a browser. This is the Web MIDI API, right? And that's pretty much all it does. It just gives you back MIDI data when you plugged in a MIDI instrument or a MIDI controller into your computer. Um, what we're doing with that is we're just requesting MIDI access on the Navigator object, and then we're just looping over all the inputs that we're getting through and just console logging them. It, it's pretty straightforward, and that's pretty much the, the bulk of the Web MIDI API. Um, there's a little sys s flag there you might see, which is set to false. If you set that to true, that means you can pass data back to the instrument or the controller. Um, that's, that's it. We've got some data. So we plugged in some hardware, and we've got some data. That's cool. We haven't even touched digital audio yet, by the way. What is that data? We've got a one for, we just, at the moment, we seem to just have random numbers. Um, this, this is things like what channel you're on, what key you're actually pressing. So for instance, 60 in the middle there, that's, that's middle C on a keyboard. If any of you do music, we know that notes are actually num like letters. And then 100 at the end, that's how hard you're pressing it. Because we don't really have hardness on a phone screen, it's kind of hard, we're just putting a random number there. That can be, that's usually 0 to 127, by the way. Um, and then, of course, we get a note off event as well. So we've got similar numbers. Again, we've got 60 for the middle C, and then 64 is your default. I don't have any data for my um, velocity at the end there. Support's not great. Um, it only sort of works in Chrome and Opera at the moment. Um, but if you're using hardware, it might, it might be localized. So if we all start using it, they might put it in other browsers. So what about sound? Because it is a musical instrument interface, right? So we do want to marry it with sound. Um, that's kind of easy. We've got a web audio API. I'm sure we've all come across it. Um, and it is the companion to the web MIDI API. So what you would do is you take the MIDI data, and then you trigger sounds with the web audio API, or triggers distortions, or whatever you wanted to do with that data. There's four main ways to make sounds with the web audio API. You can create it with an oscillator, so you can create your own sound wave. You can grab it from the DOM, so you can grab it from an audio element or a video element. You can stream it. Streams are big, so this would be something like your microphone or your camera from your device, and you can stream the audio from there. Or you can grab some files and load them into a buffer and then play it that way. Do we still have our keyboards? You are going to need your keyboards throughout the entirety of this talk. So if you scroll down to the second demo, you should be able to play keyboard sounds. You might need to turn your sound up on your device for this. They're quite quiet keyboard sounds I noticed earlier today. I got some people playing keyboards. That's cool. So what, what I've done there is I've actually downloaded a bunch of files that are keyboard sounds. I'm just loading them with the audio API into the buffer and then just playing them as, yeah, some people playing keyboards. This is good. Um, and I'm just playing them when, you, when you're hitting the keys. Right? And that's just with Web Media API, Web Audio API. Great, we've, got, we've emulated a digital keyboard in our browser, this is cool. I've got a better MIDI controller than you. Um, this is my MIDI controller, my AK LPD8. Um, I don't have it with me today, I usually have it in my handbag, it's my handbag MIDI controller. Um, and I created some sounds with the oscillator rather than loading them in. So if we play that, we'll be able to see. So it's oscillator sounds. And because we've got the Web Audio API, we can do things like distort the sound, because it's got a whole bunch of filters as well. And you might have noticed when I was hitting one of the pads harder, it was louder. That's because we've got pressure-sensitive pads as well, so you can just turn up the volume when we, when we press it harder, because we have that value. Great. There's also this overriding clock in MIDI, because timing's really important in music, and not when you're just playing music, so you don't have to keep in time with everybody, that's really important, but also when you're doing things like recording music, so you know when to play and pause and rewind to the same thing. We don't have that in the Web MIDI API. There is a reason for it. Um, I want to try really hard, if you've all got your keyboards open, illustrate timing over the web. This may or may not work. I just passed you MIDI data to make all your phones ring. And you might have noticed how they all rung at different times. I probably could have done something quite clever with like the global clock and tried to make them all time at the same time, but it's actually quite difficult because we have this latency over the web. So precise timing is actually quite tricky. 
There is this timing object model API sitting in draft in the W3C right now. If you don't take anything away from this talk because you're not interested in MIDI or audio, go and read this draft. It, it's kind of crazy. It's about an overriding timing object that you get within your application. And it should solve the problem that we had just then. I should be able to do synchronize, uh, make your phones ring all at the same time. Um, it's not just for things like MIDI to marry it with the MIDI API. I've got a flashing projector, but it's not flashing there, good. Um, it, it should, you can use it for any other media elements, so audio and video. Um, you can use it with a web animation API to time animations properly, all that kind of stuff, and the real-time stuff that I was just doing with WebSockets. Um, a couple of quotes. It provides a unifying API for timed operation and temporal control, encapsulate complexity of distributed time synchronization, which is what I was trying to illustrate there. It's very tricky. It, it's, a great, it's a great read. I, I, I really recommend it. I, sort of, I was reading it going, oh, wow, if we have this, this is like all of our problems solved. Yay, timing. Recording. Recording's important. When you're talking about sort of musical instruments, and there's a lot of uh, devices out there that are MIDI-enabled just for recording. And there is actually a MIDI machine control specification just for this. MIDI systems to communicate with and control audio recording and production systems. So this is, we've got all these instruments and we want to record them. So we've got MIDI-enabled hardware. We've also got a media recorder API on the web now. This is very cool. Um, the idea behind this is you can record a stream. So you can, for the most part, you probably use it with the microphone on your device or the camera on your device. Um, and you, you basically just pipe in, you just do new media recorder and pipe in your stream. And you can record your camera and stick it on a canvas in your browser and do some fun things with it. Um, Soledad from Mozilla has done this. She's written a really, really good article about it on the Mozilla Hacks blog if you want to find out more. I don't actually have a demo of this because um, I think maybe recording all your own faces whilst we're in the middle of a talk might be a bit weird. Um, but yeah, that's, a, that's how we're going to answer sort of the recording stuff behind MIDI on the web. Support so for that is only Chrome and Firefox, but you can go and play with it. And it's a really, really fun one to go and play with. Right, lots of specifications. There's going to be more specifications in a minute. So I'm just going to do a brief timeout. Um, MIDI instruments. I've kind, of, I've kind of talked about them, and I'm sure that there are people sitting in the audience today that are very, very comfortable with what an instrument is, what a controller is, what's MIDI enabled, what's not MIDI enabled. I'm sure there are some of you going, I have no idea about any of these things. This digital keyboard. This is probably one of the most um, common MIDI-enabled digital instruments. This, has, this is a MIDI instrument because it has onboard audio. That's one of the differences, differences between an instrument and a controller. This is relatively affordable. Um, I'm sure we've all seen them. I'm sure we've all played on them, right? It's actually more expensive to have it non-MIDI-enabled than it is to have it MIDI-enabled. If you go and buy a new keyboard today for about, I was going to say 60 pounds then, we're in euros. Um, let's say 80 euros. I don't know what the pound is at the moment. I know that it's probably the same. Let's say 60 euros. Um, <laughs> um, they, it will have a USB port on the back, and you can just plug it into your computer, and it's going to be sending you MIDI data. You can also get other electronic um, instruments, right? So this is an electronic drum kit. Um, it has onboard audio. You can just play the drums. Um, that will send MIDI data too. There's probably some way of getting that MIDI data into your browser. That could be quite fun. This is a synthesizer. There's so many different synthesizers out there. This slide should probably like have a million of them on there. Um, they're all completely different. Some of them have onboard audio. Some of them don't. Um, some of them you can create the audio on. Some of them don't. Some of them you sequence on. Some of them you create. There, there are a whole bunch of crazy stuff to, unto themselves. They're a whole family. Um, and they're all, they all do MIDI, et cetera, et cetera. This is a launch pad. Um, you probably have heard of them if you haven't come across them. Um, this, for us as developers, this is probably what we're most likely to come across. They're quite affordable. It's a controller. It doesn't have any onboard audio, but it has a USB port. You plug it in, and when you press the buttons, and it's just an array of buttons, you just get that data that we were seeing earlier. So that's, that's pretty cool. And plus, it looks really funky. I mean, this is the new one. and it, Look at all those shiny lights. That's cool. Um, other controllers, because you can get more affordable ones. I did actually look this up in euros. This is 40 euros to buy, which I think is very affordable. Um, both of these are. Um, the top one's the AKL PD8, which I showed you the video of earlier. It's just eight drum pads, eight dials. Um, it's just hardware. It's just cheap, easy hardware. Um, the second one is a Korg Nano Pad 2, also quite popular. Um, it's 16 drum pads and a little sort of mouse thing at the end, which you can use. use it's like a touch sensitive little pad. And just to show you a different range of controllers you can get, this is an Icon IDJ. Again, there's no onboard audio. It's just 
a bit of hardware with buttons and dials and fancy things. I have one of these. The idea is that you pipe music to either side of it, and then you can mix them. Um, I do it with a piece of visual software, which I wrote. So you, I can mix video. So each side has one video into itself, and then you can mix between them. Um, there's nothing on there. It's just you press the buttons, and you're getting the data. Again, this one's quite affordable. This one's about 70 pounds. So again, let's just say 70 euro. Yeah. Like I said, affordable hardware. There's loads and loads of hardware out there that we can code with JavaScript today. Um, I mean, you can code JavaScript on an Arduino. You've got things like a Spreno, which is natively JavaScript. Um, there's things like running Node on Raspberry Pis, but there's still quite a bit of onboarding. You still, if you want sort of dials, buttons, sliders, etc., you have to do soldering. And that can be fun, but you might just want to plug and play. You might just want to go, yeah, I'm going to go out, I'm going to spend 30 euro, and I'm going to plug it in, and I'm, I'm good to go. I'm now hardware-ready enabled my browser. That's really cool. Connectors. I did mention before that the DIN connector that we did have with MIDI has now superseded to USB, hence why these things have become more affordable. There's the MIDI transport specification, and that, like I said, was originally DIN, now USB. But they're also bringing out a specification, they have brought out a specification, for Bluetooth low-energy MIDI. So we're starting to see instruments that you can connect to just via Bluetooth, so you don't need USB at all. Um, and so they brought out a spec for this. This is encoding and decoding MIDI over Bluetooth, which is kind of really interesting and could be really fun. I think this is probably going to be the next MIDI controller I buy, because we have a web Bluetooth API. So we're going to be able to send MIDI data over the web Bluetooth API, I hope. It's under a flag in Chrome at the moment. Um, it's it's quite tricky to get head around if you haven't used it. It's all about sort of GAT services and uh, reading data from a device and sending it back to the device. And um, you, you kind of need a new Bluetooth chip as well because I was using an old one before Christmas and it wasn't really working with it. Um, there's a lot more information on developers.google.com forward slash web. Um, and they take you through all the different um, GAT services and how to run the code, et cetera, et cetera. What about beyond sound and hardware? We've been talking a lot about it recently. Um, when <laughs> This is a cool one. When they started bringing MIDI onto stage, and they had all these um, instruments and controllers that had MIDI enabled, um, people like the, the lighting people and the pyrotechnics people started using it as a data protocol for their own stuff. So they started to control lighting and pyrotechnics with a MIDI data protocol. So they brought out the MIDI show control spec. Um, this is quite dated now, and it's actually been superseded by the lighting people with something like DMX, which is strongly based on MIDI, but it's their own data protocol. Um, and the pyrotechnics, I think they have their own thing as well. It used to control other things like fountains. So the big fountains outside the Las Vegas casino, still controlled by MIDI, still use this spec. And that, that's insane. And this is a musical instrument spec, and we're seeing like crazy hardware being, yeah, it's cool. There is a more up-to-date spec, which is this one, which is my favorite spec. This is the MIDI visual control spec. Um, so this is about how when you go and see a sort of a band or a DJ today, you don't just go and sort of watch them on stage. They usually have a visual performance behind them. And you think, if they've got MIDI-enabled instruments, they're piping out data, and you can take that data, and you can synchronize the visuals with that data. Um, let's do that. <laughs> we all got our keyboards. This may or may not work. Right at the bottom um, of your view on the keyboards, there should be a little launch pad. Have we all got little launch pads? So I've changed your MIDI controller now. Instead of having a keyboard, you've got a little mini launch pad. And that should control some lights above. Yeah, I've got some nods. So this is all of you with your little mini launch pads controlling your little mini lights. And then if we play some music, we can sync that up. Sync it up to the music, so we can make it all flash with the music, and you can control and go in time, and yeah, it's kind of nice. What colour you are is is up to you. Um, it's quite easy to tell with so little people there. But this is just analysing audio and just having some MIDI data. Great. So, yeah, uses. This is a great API, and I'm obviously evangelizing it as well. But you're thinking, I kind of sit there and wait websites. I, I'm not going to have a website that's got an ake underneath it, and people are going to press buttons for it. Funny enough, somebody actually did do that. Um, <laughs> we make awesome Creative Madion's Adventure Machine. This is an artist who had an album launch. Um, and on their website, they emulated a, a sort of sequencer. Um, and if you had a launch pad and you plugged it in, it would actually work with the launch pad. If you didn't, because they'd emulated it on their site, you could still play around with it and you could still play around with Maddion samples. 
They had 30,000 launch pads connected to the site. Like, that's, that's nothing to be sniffed at. Even if somebody's doing it sort of 10 times, there's, there's still a lot of launch pads being connected in and people playing with it. That's a really fun use for it. Navigating web pages. We've always sort of thought about navigating web pages without a mouse, with a keyboard. But a keyboard, it is kind of small, and the buttons are quite small. Whereas something like a MIDI controller, like we, we saw some of the buttons there, they were much bigger, they might be easier for navigating web pages with, like accessibility reasons, it's just a theory. Dinosaurs. <laughs> so in the UK, we have a theme park which has these big, big dinosaurs. Um, and inside these dinosaurs is a big metal skeleton. And they're all controlled by Raspberry Pis. And we all know that we can run Node on Raspberry Pis. So um, one of my friends actually hacks these dinosaurs. And he was trying to think of ways of making them more interactive. So you've got the kids walking around the theme park. And they walk past the big T-Rex. And you've got like a motion sensor on the big T-Rex. And so when it walks past, it can sort of glare at the kids. Um, but what you could also do is you could just set up some MIDI controllers so that they can, or the little kids and the big kids, can control the little dinosaurs. They can just press some buttons and turn some dials and they can control the dinosaurs. What about your home? Your home's completely connected up to the internet these days. This is a desktop drum machine. So this doesn't have any onboard audio, but you'd sort of plug it in and you create drum sounds. Um, but it kind of looks funky and you could stick that to your wall and control your lights and do disco lights. Just saying. Um, you, you can do what I did, which was to create a bit of visual uh, mixing software, take your laptop and your MIDI controller and a little projector, um, put it in a sort of usherette tray and strap it to you, and take it to the streets at Christmas, which I did do before Christmas. And it went down very well. This is me projecting onto the streets of my city. Um, you can read all about it on 24 Ways. So yes, I was talking a lot about MIDI, and I was talking a lot about MIDI specifications. But one of the other really interesting things is they had this industry where they were bringing out specifications. And they started small, and they built up, and they took some specifications, which they kind of got rid of because they didn't really work. And it's very interesting when industries do that, and they still talk to each other, and they move things forward. That's interesting, and it's exciting. And we're in one now, and I just want to leave you on that thought. Thank you very much for listening to me talk about MIDI.